All right, Alan, looks like we're live. How are you, sir? Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I am outstanding. How are you, Jeff? I'm good. So you're like the scarecrow that got the award? For outstanding in the field? Outstanding in the field, yeah. Yeah, that's me. I am that guy. Uh, good. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm Jeff Nepper. This is my partner and Integrate Live co-founder, Alan Ray. And we are joined by some special guests today for this episode of the Integrate Live Rundown. Alan, you want to introduce everybody? Yep, Benson, I just sent you a text just so uh, as a, a um, so my gift to you. <laughs> um, so I got it. One from, uh, we'll go from the bottom. So Terry Orchard. Um, Terry Orchard is a, uh, he is my 3D printer uh, concierge. He has uh, <laughs> walked me through the process of ordering, uh, picking, ordering. And uh, so he has been a great help to me. So thank you, Terry. Ben was a part of that too. But Ben and Terry are really the technical people for Opto that have uh, outstanding. Great. Well, Terry, if you, if you can share those recommendations uh, to myself and maybe uh, the rest of our community, that'd be great because I'm going to have to buy one. Most definitely. All right. Thanks, sir. Benson is, uh, everyone knows Benson. Benson, you're a close personal friend, VP of marketing and sales for Opto22. And uh, yeah enjoy you every time you're on the on the podcast or the workshop rundown whatever we call it now what are we calling it is this still a rundown this is still the rundown all we've done is just confuse everybody by doing it before the project instead of after uh, we'll talk about that in a second so michael and dan uh, michael i met at intellect and uh, the reason we are here today because of that conversation that we had uh, around Laura Wan. I have a lot of uh, uh, interest around Laura Wan, have had so for years, have been fighting the pain points of trying to get sensors, sensor data into a control system, into a PLC, and it's been a, uh, a very difficult road. And, uh, and so we are here to solve that problem. So very excited for Michael to be here. And Dan from Multitech, I have actually two multi-techs on my desk now that I'm playing with and uh, excited about that. Um, Dan, I don't know if we met in a lot, but uh, maybe Dan and Michael, if you guys could give your background, um, that would be helpful. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, so first off, doesn't everybody have two multi-techs on their table? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know I have. Um, so my name's Daniel Kwan. Um, I'm leading our um, routers, gateways, and modems business unit at Multitech. Um, Multitech is in so many parts of your life you wouldn't believe. We do a lot of uh, design services and manufacturing of things that you use every day that don't have our name on it. And our communication equipment is inside loads of things that everybody uses in the most oddest of places sometimes. Um, and with Laura, we've been founding members of the Laura Alliance, and we've really helped uh, enable Laura into many different market segments, like these industrial market segments. Very Over to you, Michael. Michael. Yeah, I'm Michael Brower with uh, BBP. I'm the vice president at BBP. I'm an accountant by trade, which is a weird way to get into this type of uh, game. But uh, data is something that's very, very important to me. At BBP, our, our slogan is automation innovation. And we see uh, the crossover from traditional process automation to IIoT as the next areas we want to help our customers and end users innovate their practices. Um, we got connected into the IIoT game through a good friend of ours, Arlen Nipper. Uh, he came to us about two and a half years ago with a Yokogawa sushi sensor and says, well, what the heck do I do with this thing? How do I get data out of it? How do I connect it to somewhere I want to go to? And uh, after that conversation, we attended our first intellect probably about two and a half years ago. I uh, got to meet Benson for the first time. 
And we've been on that journey, helping uh, end users deploy LoRaWAN devices at scale and try to make that process as easy and simple as possible. Yeah, so I'm, I, just a little bit of transparency here. I'm very, uh, I'm excited about this one, but it really comes back to a solution I'm trying to solve on a, on a personal level on some work that I'm doing for somebody. So i um, been very pleased with our conversations and the direction we've had. But on a different note, I'm also very excited because I joined, um, I joined an, an autopsy club <laughs> and tomorrow night is open mic night. So I'm super oh, excited. Oh, oh. <laughs> That's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> it's open mic. It's open mic. Oh, night. yeah. Yeah, he, lived long, he lived a long, good life. <laughs> good guy. Uh, well, let's uh, let's talk about first. Let's address <clears throat> the rundown um, has shifted slightly. So uh, we've noticed that our project times have gotten cut shorter and shorter, uh, and it's because in order to do the project, we need to set the stage. We need to talk about the business use case. We need to identify the problem. Uh, we need to do a slight tech overview, and then we start the project in our virtual workshop, right? Uh, and then typically we use the rundown to talk about the success of the project or shortcomings or what we would change, et cetera. Uh, it was recommended by the community that we actually flop the order and use the rundown to talk about the project, uh, to do the build up, to, to find the use case, to uh, understand current state and why it why we should look at changing it. And then that gives us actually a full hour or hour and a half to build the project and get more uh, involved in the project. And so that's exactly what we're doing. The rundown is now uh, the week before the virtual workshop, which means next Wednesday, same time, uh, head over to integratelive.com if you haven't registered uh, and register for the webinar, which is our virtual workshop. And we're gonna follow this format moving forward we're also going to take the rundown previous episodes, this episode and future episodes and start adding them uh, as podcasts on, of course, Spotify, Apple Podcasts and your other uh, more common podcast platforms. So if you're listening to this live and now, great. We'll see you next Wednesday. If you're listening to this as a recorded podcast um, in the description, of the podcast, you'll find the recording for the virtual workshop um, that has already occurred. I, I'm having a Marty McFly moment here, a little back to the future. I don't know how to talk about things that haven't occurred to somebody who thinks they already have. It's, it's weird. Okay. Speaking of things that have occurred, real quick, everybody, congratulations to Alan. Alan, you have a new role that you've taken. You want to tell the community what it is? Yeah. So I, I left Air Energy. Um, 2022, April 2022, and I'm very excited about the opportunity to be a consultant and kind of move into that next phase of my life where I would no longer be an employee, but have a little more flexibility. And uh, uh, my very first consulting uh, job was with 3M, working as a architect, uh, security architect for the OT space. And um, that led into I am now been offered and accepted the position for operational technology director for all of 3M. Congratulations. So you're doing security for 3M. Yeah, and that is not parking cars, Jeff. I'm not out parking no. lot with pepper spray. It's cyber security. Okay. You know. Do you get a unit? I, I can see it in your eyes, Jeff. Yeah, I just like, is there a Segway or a golf cart that you ride around on? No, no, I did. I did have a really good childhood, I think, played into this opportunity. You know, my dad used to roll me down the hill and in, in tires all the time. And those were good years. <laughs> well, Which congratulations. To my, you know, foundation that, that led me to 3M. Well, congratulations on, on the job well earned and deserved. And uh, we're glad to, glad to have that new perspective coming from you, from the things that you've uh, encountered along the way. All right. Well, hey, let's, let's get into it. Um, 
let's start by talking about LoRaWAN. Um, it's a technology that I think some of our audience might be very familiar with. Um, we did a poll uh, a couple weeks ago that just asked, you know, um, uh, have you used LoRaWAN? Uh, yes. No, but I know about it. And no, I'm not familiar with it. And it was really a, a nice third slice the whole way across. So um, we should probably just start with a baseline understanding of what is Laura Wan. Uh, and Dan, I can't think of anybody probably better to tell us about that than you. Yeah, split me open. It says Laura Wan on the inside. Um, hey, you or want at to least be a part of our autopsy group? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm not sure I want to see what, what would uh, come out of that. Um, so look, let's first look at what is a low power wireless access network. Uh, they're often called LPWA networks, low power wireless access. And, and there's a lot of different technologies out there that qualify in this criteria, things like Zigbee, things like Ysun, Myoti, uh, Narrowband IoT, and LoRaWAN as well. Um, but all low power wireless access technologies uh, are typically designed to connect millions of devices. It's, this is the massive IoT. This isn't like a jet engine that you know drops 600 gigs of data every time it lands on the runway. This is the massive amount of sensors and devices that are just in every building, um, every facility, smart cities, and so on. They typically, they don't have to, but they typically run on batteries. And of course, nobody wants to replace those batteries. So they live on batteries for years um, versus you know, requiring a charge every night like your mobile phone. Uh, they tend to be very low cost because you know, if you're gonna scale out millions of billions of uh, massive IoT devices, they, they're obviously gonna have to be cost efficient. And you typically get really great building penetration. But like I said, this isn't jet engines. It's a few bytes, hundreds of bytes, maybe in an extreme case, a few kilobytes of data a day. Simple to deploy, secure, and scalable. And, and LoRaWAN um, really comes into play in, in a segment of the market where the range may be close, but the range may be a long way away, You know, maybe measured in miles away, right? Those battery life, again, measured in years. And, uh, and one of the reasons why LoRa has been so successful in the market, and it really is at this point um, taking the largest share of the market for low power wireless access, and it's growing now at 30% CAGR. There's about 300 million device shipments to date, and, and that will be well beyond a billion um, in the next uh, two or three years here. So, um, so the reason for that success has been the versatility. If you look at technologies like Sigfox, Narrowband, IoT, they tend to be very focused around an operator. An operator sells you a contract, you have a million units, you buy another one, you now have a contract for a million and one units. And although that's very flexible in terms of you know, adding devices to the network, in industrial segments, um, that OPEX tends to eat you alive, CAPEX is more of a preference, and often that data is ingested into on-prem systems, which I'm sure we're going to see today. And LoRa can do both of those models, and that gives it a, a lot of agility between deployment types and, and business models. And, and it has a huge ecosystem now. Like every technology, there's an alliance. In this case, there's the LoRa Alliance. And the LoRa Alliance was founded by Semtech, Multitech, some operators and vendors. There were 15 of us um, back in 2015. Now it's a 400 plus member ecosystem. Everything from semiconductors to modules, to sensors, to gateways, to cloud services and AI services. So, um, so it's a really broad ecosystem. And, and I'll pause there. You, you spoke of origin just a little bit. Um, so you said multi-tech was one of the 
was one of the Laura Alliance founders. Yeah, we were founding members of the Laura Alliance back in March 2015, Belly of the Beast. We launched at Mobile World Congress. <laughs> And um, and Semtech um, was another founding company, as was Actility and um, KPN and um, yeah, yeah. Dan, I have, I have fifteen some questions. I have some questions around the alliance specifically, and um, there's very clear uh, guidelines on how to deploy and how to um, build a LoRaWAN sensor. Um, are you finding that the, the companies who are joining the alliance are following those guidelines, or is it pretty? Um, is there a lot of is there a lot of room for? I'll take the OPC um, kind of, or Modbus if you're more familiar with Modbus, which is I interpret how the standard is, and then I decide how you know I define design it how I want type of thing, right? So. How has the Laurel Wan Alliance been accepted in the community, and is it? Do you feel like it's being uh, followed in a in a manner that if I go to the alliance, if I buy a sensor that is a part of the alliance, can I be confident that that sensor is going to be aligned with the Laurel Wan standard? Yes, you can. Um, so the LoRa Alliance has a certification um, system in place, uh, and, and and that tests the uh, the sensors and other interfaces within that whole LoRaWAN community. Um, but any sensor that has been uh, tested and passed the LoRa Alliance certification, um, I think you have good um, interoperability. Um, and very low risk of, of, of issues there. Um, and, and that's been part of the success of creating an alliance and all of these you know, broad members doing sensors and semiconductors and, and modules that, that interoperability is key. Um, without interoperability, then we're just back to proprietary RF technologies where it's an essentially a vendor lock-in and, and none of the vendors um, are looking for that lock-in. We're looking for a large um, market opportunity, many different use cases and, and broad interoperability. So, so LoRa itself is a physical layer, and LoRa is used in you know point to point, like garage door openers or something. Um, it's also used in AWS Sidewalk and the open standard broad industry participation is with LoRaWAN, the software that then sits above that physical layer that provides you that interoperability amongst a broad number of uh, vendors. Okay, so now my next question is, let's say as somebody who may uh, want to, you know, um, buy a sensor, right? I say I own the integration company and we're going to deploy a bunch of sensors. Um, if I come across the company who has the sensor that I like, but they're not a part of the alliance, my, my ask obviously is, you know, one, you need to be part of the alliance. That way I can ensure that you're, that the sensor is, you know, defined and, and meets all the, gu the guardrails. What's the effort for a company who has a sensor that they want to get a part of the alliance what is that lift for them to go through that process um yeah so um so just because a member uh, a sensor manufacturer is not a member of the law alliance that doesn't just immediately rule out that that sensor could ever be used but for sure if you want that low risk and that confidence that you've mm -hmm. got great interoperability being a member being listed on the uh, LoRa Alliance certification website as a certified device, that, that definitely um, provides you that confidence. As for a member joining, um, I think a doctor membership, which enables you to go through the certification and use the LoRa Alliance logos to prove that you have that interoperability. I think membership is about $6,000 and typically it's a, a few thousand dollars to certify a sensor. It depends how many regions in the world you, you want to certify. And it's a very structured scheme. Um, there's 17025 accredited test labs that do that testing. 
Um, so it's, it's quite rigorously um, put into place in order to ensure interoperability. And if you're looking for sensors, look no further than Michael over there, who has one of the industry's most impressive range of sensors, including multi-tech sensors. Yeah, so I had, a, I had a really good conversation with Todd Asinger from Chevron uh, around the need for us as the end users to be very diligent about making sure that we are pushing our uh, vendors who want to supply these sensors to the alliance. Because uh, one of the things that we have to do is as, a, as an end user, we have to enable that alliance to become, you know, really a community that is going to protect us as end users on the low risk, high confidence of what we're trying to deliver, right? And so um, just again, for anyone who may be listening, um, I, I just want to encourage end users and people that are going to be using these sensors to really be thinking through you know, how do we support this community and how do we best make sure that the longevity of what we're trying to drive to and what we can talk about the growth in the in the market and how this thing is exploding. I mean, look, we went to Intellect. Almost everyone on the call was there. I think Terry and Ben weren't there, but or Jeff, you weren't there either. But at Intellect, right, what did you see throughout that entire uh, conference, right? Everyone was talking about Laura Wan. And so it's it's clearly it's clearly coming on in the the north and uh taking off here and so um again i just want to call out a plea to make sure that we are we are joining with the community and the alliance to make sure that we're delivering low risk high confident sensors so i've just spent the last three maybe four years pandemic gets a bit sketchy right but the last three or four years um leading an industrial work group at the laura alliance and so you got the open standards you got the certification level above that and then above that you have almost like a working group that's focused on industrial segments um, Sync Automation is a member of that. Um, many of the sensor companies like Yokogawa, Riot, Eloxi, uh, TWTG, and many more are all members of that group. Then taking it to the next level, how do we use these sensors in productive ways? What is the return on investment for the customer? And how do they integrate it into the complex systems? I mean, most LoRa deployments, the types of deployments you see in supermarkets, inside the refrigeration units, quick serve restaurants. These are all sensor into a gateway and immediately into a cloud platform for processing. And that makes a lot of sense if you're doing health and food and, and, and hygiene services, right? But in an in industrial segment, it's, it's just not that simple, right? That data needs to go in to an established system and with that comes machine protocols, IT, OT integration. Um, so it's a, a little bit more complex. And that's what we've been focusing in on, on that smart industry work group. And it was many of those members that you saw in Entelec. And for those listening who perhaps didn't quite catch Entelec, Entelec is a 100-year-old energy association which does a yearly show in Houston. And, and this is where we had um, a ton of LoRa devices all publishing data over Spark Plug B into an MQTT broker. And it was a really um, floor-wide organic demo and collaboration between members, R really highlighting that interoperability. Yeah, and I, I will just double down on your point about the industrial piece of it because the pain point that I've experienced specifically with LoRa has been um, the translation from LoRa into some kind of a protocol to the control system and the ability to be able to do that. Because then remember, at the OT side, we have we have technicians that are typically program programmers around ladder logic and PLCs, HMIs, graphical stuff. But these aren't computer science people typically, right? And so you, we're, we're having to, to bridge this gap between these complex protocols and the the actual sensor data 
at the PV level, just getting into the control system. And that bridge has been painful and, and it's been a, a very complex uh, kind of journey trying to get there. And this is why we are here today, because um, really what I saw when I walked past the booth that Michael and Sarah were in, you know, it was like a light bulb came on. It's like, yeah, this is it. This is what we need. Now, um, I'm very excited about where we're headed, right? Because one of the things that uh, the problems that I saw, which again, Travis and the ignition folks love them. They've been a part of our community and I want them to continue to be successful. But here's the problem that we have with control systems, right? When I have, I, I have a piece of data that I need to get to my control program. I don't want to have to have my HMI go grab that data and then push it back down into the PLC. That is a that is not best practice. What I want to do is I want to have my control system obtain that piece of data and then have it readily available to the control scenario so then I can make decisions or do what I need to do. Right. And so, um, yeah, and that's what we're going to, that's what we're here to show. We're here to show and we'll see the architecture drawings, but having a next in PLC like the Opto 22 Epic or the Rio, but today we're talking about the op the Epic, having that Epic have the ability to be able to now bring that data directly from the multi-tech gateway right into the control system. Yeah. Um, so we're all familiar with home, home IoT stuff, right? Nest thermostats, ring doorbells, and so on. And so ourselves um, and Sync Automation BBP here, we've really taken inspiration out of that in order to take the best of that, that user experience of using a smartphone, blipping the barcode, bringing complex amounts of identifiers, MAC addresses, uh, key shares into a platform, um, and then provisioning these devices in a way in which you don't have to be a developer to do that. And, and you know, Michael, uh, it's, it's been a journey, right? But, but I think we're getting to the point now where you have the complexity of OT with perhaps an onboarding experience a little bit more familiar to a home environment. Yep. Oh, it's, it's, it's definitely been quite the journey and the iterations we've gone through along the way. We've been wanting to get data back into people's control systems on the lower WAN side for pretty much the whole time we've been in this. And I feel like we've made more progress in the last month, month and a half since Intellect than we've made in the, in the prior two years combined. And a lot of that goes to Alan's point of this is what the power of a next gen PLC platform can do for you. Because in our previous iterations, we were learning what a programming language called Erlang was. You know, we were mapping Modbus registers. We were going through a very, very difficult process that every time we step through it, we're like, our end users are never, ever going to support this. Uh, you mentioned Todd Angslinger with, with Chevron. You know, once he figured out the custom code we had to write to, to be able to do those paths, he would have immediately said, no way, I can't deploy this at scale. So I'm really excited about, you know, the work Sarah and Jessica Williams and others on my team have done to work with Terry, Ben, Benson, and Alan to, to get this thing to the next level. And we're, we're really excited to share uh, what, what's been developed. It's probably a good time um, to go ahead and show the project architecture. And we've, I think we've, Benson, you're always so good at, at nailing use cases or defining the business logic, the business use case that we need. Uh, not to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. If you could just sum it up quickly, why should someone show up next Wednesday to see this project? What's the value they're getting? Sure. So, you know, if you look at the tenets of what Opto is, and we've been around for 50 years, right? And a lot of people know us for IO systems, for control systems, and so on. Uh, we've been developing, you know, PC-based I.O. in the 80s, uh, hybrid controllers in the 90s. And then today, of course, we have uh, Epic and Rio. But it comes down to two things. It's the democratization of OT data over a secure platform. So those two things really go in hand in hand. And, and when you're talking about an OT environment, uh, more now more than ever, security is absolutely paramount. Um, but also that notion of being able to acquire a lot of data from the field in an OT environment 
and pull that in, as Alan described, into a control narrative to be able to make decisions on that data and then be able to take that data, model it up, and then get it up to other what we call northbound applications. That could be a SCADA system on premise, that could be a cloud application, that could be you know, all the way up into say AWS or Azure for you know, long-term historical uh, data collection, maybe some predictive analytics and so on. But that path, that journey from the point of the sensor over a lower WAN network, all the way up to all the other applications that can you know, derive value from that data has been you know, somewhat of a challenge. Uh, lower WAN is, is very popular. Uh, particularly in those applications, what I've seen, and I don't have a deep experience in lower WAN, but what I see on on the veneer is, you know, some terrific applications, but they tend to be a little bit bespoke in the sense that I've got a sensor to a gateway to a cloud environment, and I've got a very vertically integrated, uh, you know, data path, if you will, but it's been a little difficult to grab that data and use it for other things. And that's essentially where what we've worked together with, with Michael and, and of course, Dan and his uh, multi-tech gateway uh, to try to, you know, again, democratize that data, not only all the way up to a cloud level, but down to an on-premise edge level. And, and that's really where uh, I, I see a, a lot of magic here is, is this notion of cloud computing is, is terrific. We, you know, we all see some advantages in that, but ultimately we need to make decisions in the field. And we need to make decisions with a lot of different types of data, wherever those that data may come from. Now, again, as an IO company, analog, digital, serial, CAN, Modbus, perhaps, uh, those those are pretty well taken care of. But LoRaWAN has been a little bit more difficult. So that's what we're trying to do here. And in terms of a business use cases, you know, obviously we can see a lot happening with LoRaWAN in uh, applications where you have a lot of remotely or geographically dispersed assets. So we've got long distances to go uh, and we, we need to be able to put low cost sensors on say a tank level or a pump or maybe some energy data and be able to pull that back at some periodic level. And that's where LoRaWAN really fits in. You know, you think a wide field of, uh, you know, uh, oil derricks or tanks or whatever, that's a great business use case. But we're also seeing it a lot now in manufacturing or as, as Dan pointed out, you know, some of the successes Laura Wen has had is in quick serve restaurants or, or hospitals uh, or you know, perhaps uh, warehouse centers, whatever. The idea is still, how do I get that real world data, that, that, that something that's happening, a signal in the real world and get it into a control system or get it into an application where we can derive value from it. And so that's, that's really where we're seeing a lot of those use cases is, is there's still a, you know, a big world out there of traditional analog and digital IO, but we know that, you know, that, that comes with wiring costs, that comes with uh, you know, an instrumentation tech that knows how to set that, uh, that particular sensor up, whether it's a 4 to 20 milliamp or a circuit or a zero to 10 voltage. But now we can start pulling in a lot of this other data that's already you know, that pulled up over a, a lower WAN network and integrate it along with all the other IO systems. Right. So that's that's where we see some advantages. So certainly it's the notion that on the southbound side, you know, rather than just traditional I.O. signals, now we can start pulling in a lot of disparate signals from many devices. And one of the cool things about LoRaWAN is those sensors. There's vibration sensors with, you know, a little a little hockey puck type device that with a magnetic base, I can drop onto a on, onto a pump or on a motor and quickly bring that vibration data back and pull that into the control narrative. Or again, move that all the way up to some application that can do predictive analytics on it. So that's really where, what we're talking about here is again, when I say democratization of data, I'm talking about it from the sensor level all the way through the value chain. Uh, and that's, that's where we're seeing it. The, I'll give you a real life use case that I'm dealing with, uh, with a, a, a company that had ask some questions about a water district, right? So they pump out a canal, they pump a mile down to a, a stand tank, and then there's pumps there and they pump a mile down to another stand tank. And they have uh, e serial radios between the pumping station and the stand tank. When they lose that serial communication, they're scrambling to rush out there and make sure they don't, the system doesn't de-energize, right? And so, we talked about, man, th throw a, a multi-tech gateway up 
and just start putting in level sensors at these at these stand tanks. And now if you lose your your RF side of the the serial or have a problem there, you got a redundant level that you can, can maintain control but keep going. And I said, here's here's where Thora starts to get really exciting because that's a a use case that hey, this is when a problem that uh, a real world problem we have all the time. But now think about this. If I have a, a multi-tech gateway at each pumping station, now I can literally go buy nine vibration sensors, drop them on these high pressure, high, very expensive pumps. And now I've got vibration sensors. I don't have to do anything else. I drop them on, scan them. They're in my system. Well, then I can go to, hey, I've got all these valves that these farmers are opening and closing, and I don't know when they're doing it. Well, now I can go buy a LoRaWAN sensor that I can bolt to this valve ha handle, and now I know when the valve's open and closed. I don't have to buy another gateway. I don't have to do anything. I scan, I scan the sensor, pay a couple hundred bucks, drop it on a valve, and now I've got visibility to that valve opening and closed. But, but where it gets exciting is I solved the problem of the redundancy that has to be solved. I put the gateway in. I got the antenna up. Then the, the world is now opened to anything I can think of. I can go to the Alliance and I can start looking at well, what else could I do? It's water sensors in the ground. I can, uh, that, so that's where the magic really starts to happen, where you solve a real problem. But then once you have the infrastructure in, man, sky's the limit. Yeah, exactly. That first use case that really has the impressive ROI, like chemical tank monitoring. Chemical is yeah. a massive expense for oil and gas companies. So managing that brings in the network. But now the barrier to the next use case is way lower. And, and we're seeing digitization of every part of the business. Um, if, if you don't have the data, then you can't make data-driven decisions accurately. And that's what these sensors are doing, just like Benson uh, highlighted. They're bringing up more data about the environment around you, everything from a valve moving, temperature, particulates, pressure. And this enables SCADA and control systems to make more informed decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's, it's, yeah, like you say, it scales very fast um, yep. once that hero use case pulls through um, a low cost infrastructure. And the barrier has been for, <clears throat> for the industrial side has been, okay, I got a gateway up. I can go buy a transmitter. Who the heck am I going to get to figure out how I get this transmitter into the gateway? And then once it's there, how do I get it into the PLC? That, and Jeff, you can pull the architecture up, but that's what we're solving. We're literally going to show you how you can take your phone out. You go to SightSync, you buy a transmitter, you scan that transmitter with your phone and the IO populates dynamically right into your PLC. And now you can start using it. Well, that that actually sounds a lot like me adding a <clears throat> an air tag to to my Apple ecosystem or a Nest thermostat, maybe for my basement. Um, so it's just QR. Michael is I guess this is on your side, right? This is yep. Yeah, you, this is this is we're not a, we're not original. We don't have uh, the most original ideas. What we saw is <laughs> what was hap happening on the commercial IoT side, and me being a simple minded person, I said, why? can't IIoT be as easy as commercial IoT? Why is deploying a sushi sensor, deploying a radio bridge, voltage sensor, deploying a Vega radar any different than deploying my blink camera system, my ring doorbell? And uh, that's you know what we worked with Multitech, what we worked with Opto to create. And uh, through our SightSync LoRaWAN module, we're, we're able to provide that same level of user experience you're used to on the commercial IoT side. So, so walk, us, walk us through the step-by-step, -step, if you would, again. Yeah, so in this architecture, obviously at the hub of the architecture, you've got our uh, Opto22 group Epic, and it is running the SightSync LoRaWAN module. And in this use case, we've got two main components of the LoRaWAN module that are doing a lot of the heavy lifting. So that first cloud you see is called LNS Sync, and LNS Sync stands for a LoRaWAN network server. And then what you'll see next week, and what Sarah and Jessica will build out, is our LoRaWAN network server is running on the Conduit gateway. 
So that's one of the very cool things about working with multi-tech products is you have the power to do a completely modular system. So in this case, you know, instead of running a central LNS, we're running an LNS right on the gateway. And, you know, if two years down the road, we decide we want a central LNS, we want to run an LNS on the, the Groove Epic, we can move the LNS there and turn that gateway into a packet forwarder and change our architecture on the fly. So a lot of people get hung up on what is my architecture going to be? How do I, you know, get it out perfectly? Once we start involving IT in the conversation, you know, they get very, very concerned about where to host the LoRaWAN network server. And, you know, Dan and my advice to them, and, and Alan, I think you, you're you seeing the same thing is, you know, get the system out there, solve a real world problem. And once you have that architecture out there, I think you'll find out that there is additional things you'll want to do with it because you've lowered that barrier entry. You're not going to nail it the first time with a perfect architecture, but pick one that's certified by the LoRa Alliance, pick one that doesn't lock you into anything and you can evolve it as your use cases evolve because what might work well for a Yokogawa Sushi pressure sensor might not work well for an Aloxy valve position sensor. So I'm, it's it's very much a let's get started. I'm so, hearing you describe, hey, let's proof of concept, proof of value, even pilot, we yeah. probably don't have to figure out the long-term architecture yet, right? but know that we're not committing ourselves to technical debt by moving through these three phases until we're ready to then talk about mass deployment. Absolutely. And, and you know, kind of back to the architecture of what we'll show in next week, we'll show you how to deploy three different end nodes. So in that top left, you see a radio bridge voltage sensor that uh, is a pretty unique device. Uh, it can measure the voltage and it can either use its own battery or it can be powered off of uh, what it's measuring to be able to transmit voltage levels. Uh, that'll be our first device. And then that middle one is a Yokogawa pressure sensor, uh, their sushi pressure sensor line. Uh, and then the last one is a Vega radar uh, that checks in four times a day and uh, can measure up to three meters. And you typically see that on chemical tote monitoring, but uh, I actually have one with me today and it does a very crappy job and I, you know that's my lame attempt at a dad joke but the number one use case for this product right now is the largest porta potty skid manufacturer in europe so they're monitoring the inventory levels of the tanks on those skids that you see at you know concerts festivals things like that and they're basically eliminating truck rolls hey, I'm only going to go empty the tank on those when I know I need to, because as we know in Europe, fuel's expensive. And if you can eliminate truck rolls, you can deliver the ROI to pay for a sensor that does a crappy job. That is a terrible use case because I don't ever want those things to not be emptied on a regular basis if I have to use them. <laughs> so, but uh, with the sensor, you can see our, uh, our QR code on it. So if you buy a sensor through SightSync, you get a QR code added to it. When you scan it with your phone, it goes using the power of QR sync and LNS sync. It uh, connects that node to the multi-tech gateway. And then the multi-tech gateway starts sending the data via MQTT over to the Groove Epic. Wow. So it's yeah. literally scan and it shows up. Yeah. Which is super powerful, right? Because um, the OT guide does not need to be a LoRa expert, does not need to be a founding member of the LoRa Alliance or a member, does not have to figure out what is a LoRa network server, how does that work, how are my keys enabling me to have a secure transport and secure control. Instead, all of that is almost like Wi-Fi, you know, Wi-Fi on one side, but IP frames go into the internet in the other side, right? So it's sort of similar. LoRa on one side, all fully secure, going into an Opto 22 as a simple IT um, subpub model. Um, so it really, um, it really sort of sweeps under the carpet um, a lot of complexity that that we've been able to. Um, to, to enable through things like QR coding, much the same as, as IoT. It's a lot more complicated than it looks when you put in um, a, uh, a Nest thermostat. You just don't see it, so you don't appreciate it. Now, once that information is sitting at the Groove 
uh, in this case, the epic, then it's where do you want it to go, right? Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, uh, for those that uh, are, are viewing uh, this event, uh, you can see now an architecture on the screen, but for those of you just listening, essentially that's uh, th what the architecture is depicting is this notion again of pulling a lot of different data sources, whether they're traditional IO, uh, whether they're other PLCs or other RTUs or other devices uh, that are in an OT environment, then we add in the, the LoRaWAN multi-tech gateway, which of course is connected to sensors as we saw in the previous architecture. Now we're gonna collect all that data, pull it into the Epic. And the thing that's unique about the Epic and one of the things we strive to do is to essentially collapse the, the complicated network stack and the application stack into a single manageable and secure device. So now we can take advantage of all the software that's resident on the Epic for various tasks, again, using the right software for the job at hand. So in this case, uh, we are going to integrate the uh, LoRaWAN sensor data directly into a control program for one, but there's also an HMI there. So for local operator interface, we're able to actually look at the LoRaWAN uh, sensor data at the edge. So in, compared to some traditional architectures that I've been exposed to, a lot of the LoRaWAN data goes up to the cloud and then you can pull the data back down to the cloud and put it into your control narrative. This kind of pushes all that network stack and that, that technology stack right down to the edge. So we're actually collecting the data, modeling it, and then doing something interesting with it right at the edge. So whether you want to use Node-RED or you want to use Ignition or you want to expose all that LoRaWAN uh, sensor data as OPC, all of that is capable right on the Epic. Now, what makes this somewhat unique is uh, the, the Epic, and like some other applica uh, hardware applications out there, it's built on an open Linux-based platform. So all of this software is essentially running on a Linux real-time OS, uh, including the control program, which is tied to the real-time thread of the Linux OS, so we can perform real-time controls you would anticipate and expect from any PLC in the field. The other part that's uh, built into the Epic is this notion of what we call shell access or SSH. And this is a, a, a part of the architecture, the part of the hardware system that allows us to develop our own applications and do something maybe different than what's in the canned applications. Uh, and that's essentially what uh, um, Michael and his team have done. They've taken their application software called SiteSync, which of course includes the LNS module and the QR module, uh, each of those are uh, integrated, developed in uh, C++, uh, C++, Java, Python, whatever their chosen language is, and they're taking that in and actually installing it on the Epic. So it takes care of what Dan said, you know, the sweeping under the rug, right? We're taking, you know, taking all that complexity of getting a sensor onboarded into the system and then into the, uh, into the control program or the HMI or anything else that the Epic can do. All of that is taken care of by the SightSync software, including that notion of scanning the sensor and getting it uh, commissioned. So that, that all happens down at the edge. And then what's also depicted in the architecture is above that. So it, it, we've got everything happening at the edge as we anticipate. We're able to perform uh, control or uh, local HMI, democratization of the data through various means of MQTT, OPC, whatever you want. But then we have a lot of power in that same software to start to, again, distribute or democratize that data to many other what we call northbound applications. Those could be on premise. So I want to get the data into a local database or I want to get it into a local SCADA system like Ignition. Uh, that's all those tools are built in. And that connection from the edge to those northbound applications are 100% secure. All TLS encrypted, all uh, authenticated connections, uh, user pass, API keys, and so on. But it doesn't stop there. We can now also use that same technology to move the data right into cloud applications. Probably the most used method here is that of MQTT and Sparkplug B. But rather than just taking a sensor value and maybe publishing it up, uh, up into the, the cloud or to an on-premise application as a PV for a temperature or a pressure, we can actually now use the edge system to model that data, to put it into an asset class essentially, to create an object 
that gives us a lot more contextual information about what kind of data we're collecting. So now we actually do the modeling right at the edge and then move it on its way up to the northbound applications. And a lot of, you know, a clear way, a clear easy way and secure way of doing that is with, uh, with MQTT. And then finally, also depicted on the architecture is the ability to see that data on any kind of device that is, you know, has network connectivity. And of course, I'm talking about things like your smartphone, uh, your, your uh, iPad or tablet, a PC, pretty much anything that can run a modern web browser. So now I have, again, uh, you know, imagine in a use case, somebody in the field, they're going out to a site, they can pull out their phone and they can see exactly what's going on without necessarily, you know, bringing a laptop and hosing up to the uh, to the PLC. Uh, they, they can get all that data they need right there at their phone, maybe not even right at the site, just within, you know, uh, the range of their network. Uh, they can start uh, seeing this data. So that's really what what we're trying to do at the edge is this, this combination of, of hardware and software all working together to make it as easy as possible to commission everything and then model the data and then get it where it needs to be and where it can deliver value. And what's more important is, again, in, from an MQTT perspective, we do this in a decoupled way. What, what does that mean? That means we're not, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, we're taking a sensor all the way up to the cloud. And that's a pretty tightly coupled system. But if we can bring the data in, put it in the Epic, and then start to expose it or democratize that data through MQTT, suddenly we have all kinds of other applications that can now access that data without having a necessarily a direct connection to say the LoRaWAN gateway or even the Epic in this case. It's literally democratized to anybody who's uh, authenticated and uh, you know, allowed to go and see that data and use it in any kind of application they choose, whether that's SCADA, whether that's predictive analytics, whether that's AI and ML, doesn't matter. It's always a single source of truth from the edge, moved up, modeled in a contextual way uh, and available to anyone who can use it. So I got a great example of that, Benson. Uh, Chevron, who we worked with for doing tank level monitoring out in Bakersfield, they ended up outsourcing that business to their supplier. And so mm -hmm. that sensor, very similar to the one that, um, that, that Michael showed, this one was by Rye Edge Solutions, but it's measuring that uh, tank depth. That's all going into that SCADA system, which is going into their um, Azure um, um, mm -hmm private cloud and then their chemical provider sees that measurement and then takes that measurement and converts it back into delivery time how much chemical is going to be delivered to bring it back to where it needs to be and and i'm sure there's many other factors that come in like what's that cost going to be and and you know other commercial factors so that platform gets enriched with more data based on that fundamental measurement coming up from those tanks mm -hmm. It's, it's funny if we take a, a, a short little history trip. Uh, we've been involved in, it's called IoT now, but back in the day it was called M2M, uh, machine to machine communications. And there was a couple of companies that were really you know, heralding this notion of uh, device connectivity. The technology wasn't really ready for prime time. Uh, back in M2M was like 1999, 2000. But the use cases that everybody always talked about was somewhat similar. You know, Take a vending machine, put a sensor on it. Uh, and use a cellular network, and this was again championed by a company that's uh, called you know, Nokia. If anybody's been around for a while, they know that Nokia used to be the largest handset manufacturer in the world, uh, when they were looking for ways to use that cellular network. But the technology wasn't there. It was too expensive, it was too complicated, uh, and so M2M never really took off at, at scale. Um, enter IoT, enter uh, technologies like LoRaWAN and the software that that makes that, that uh, LoRaWAN network easy to use. And suddenly some of those early use cases like vending machines or propane tanks or whatever can become a reality. Back then it was all just talk, right? It's like I mean, people could understand, yeah, if the vending machine goes out, we'll send a truck, uh, same, same point. But again, the technology wasn't there. It is here today. Uh, and while a lot of what we're gonna focus on is you know, true industrial type applications, but indeed, this technology that we're using in industrial applications has a lot of use cases way outside of industrial. And that's proven by the, what, you know, 50 million lower WAN devices that are out there today. And I'm not even sure if that number is correct. I'm sure Dan can 
uh, correct me, but it is you know in the tens of millions. So I think that's an important consideration. Yeah, and the market has moved on, just like you said. I mean, to sort of say what you just said in a slightly different way, um, the industry was always stuck in pucks, you know, can it work? You know, what, what's it going to take to make it work? Well, we, the industry, we all have innovation labs. We have um, partners that have living labs. That That's the pucks. It's all there. No company needs to do a puck anymore. And you can right. see it's real, right? So it's really now about pilots. And and so most companies have moved from pilots pilots, they're now uh, pox, they're now in pilots. Those pilots could be five, 10,000 unit deployments, right? And, and where the market challenge now is, is how do you go from a pilot into hyperscalability of hundreds of thousands, millions of deployments, not just chemical tanks in a baker's field, oil field, but chemical tanks globally for the operations. And, and, and this is the chasm that we're now crossing. And this, this zero touch on board in security, democratization of the data, this is how we're crossing the chasm, the hyperscalability. What is the uh, market share for the sensors, Dan? So market share of LoRaWAN um, is is very similar to Narrowband IoT, in part because of China being a heavy supporter of Narrowband. Outside of China, LoRaWAN is considerably higher than Narrowband IoT. But those the analysts always show those two technologies as being the eighty percent of the market. So, mm. so certainly outside of China, um, LoRaWAN is is by far the largest just segment of that low power. What are we access. talking about then? Sensor count. Um, so free Semtech, um, who you know, manufacture a lot of these semiconductors, they have a number out there of 300 million units lifetime shipments. Low power wireless access as a genre um, will be about one and a half billion this year. So so what's what's that? That's uh, maybe 20% market share. But but LoRaWAN is growing at a 30% CAGR and um, and many of those low power wireless access technologies are um, legacy technologies at this point. So so let's say 20% for LoRa today in that whole low power wireless access um, this will be more like 40% plus over the next four or five years. And I think another thing worth mentioning here is, you know, if we look at traditional sensors, I can buy a transmitter and if it has a four to 20 milliamp output, in other words, and a four to 20 input into a PLC, I can use it with my PLC, whatever PLC that might be. So any transmitter, it's four to 20, to pretty much any PLC that can accept a four to 20 milliamp signal. That's what we're starting to see now with LoRaWAN. We look at some of the other uh, uh, LPWA technologies, they tend to have a lot of volume. And so you can't necessarily do this sensor with this PLC. So this notion that we can take something like LoRaWAN with the, you know, the help of the Alliance and, and these tool, uh, tool chains that we've created to make it easy to use, now I can, right? Now I can take any LoRaWAN sensor and potentially connect it to any next gen plc traditional plcs it's going to be a challenge but that's also facilitated by edge devices and that's that's really the key is i should be able to you know select a sensor and know that it's going to work with my system uh, and i think that's the the path that uh, laura wan is on yeah and I, I think there's two things we need end users to do uh with their sensor manufacturers and with the LoRa alliance and it's something my colleague clint guillory with sync automation with being a member of the industrial working group is working on is one, we have these QR codes. We don't want to print QR codes for the end of days. We want those to come on the sensor manufacturer already in the standard LoRaWAN approved format so that our software can just work with the, the codes and labels that are put on the devices that the device manufactured. And the second one is, you know, we need sensor manufacturers to share their decodes. We need them to share their decode so that, you know, when you use a platform like SiteSync, when you use a LoRaWAN network server like TTN, you have the decodes already in the library. And it's not on the end user to figure out Java or some other programming language to decode hexadecimal and decode a sensor. No one wants to do that. That's what's prevented the scalability to date. And uh, if there's end users listening, that's how we can, you know, move this thing forward and cross that chasm that Dan, you know, outlined 
So just for those out there who are perhaps not so familiar with LoRaWAN, LoRaWAN doesn't use an IP connection to the edge like your mobile phone does, right? And so the piece between the sensor and the network server, which can run in the gateway or on-prem or in the cloud, um, that piece is not IP-based. So when you're surfing your phone doing Facebook or whatever, um, all of those packets are going to an IP address that is the Facebook um, server on the internet, which knows the format of how that data is going to be encoded. And uh, this is not quite the same. Instead, we need an intermediary piece, a piece that can slice and dice the data up to be a temp sensor in centigrade or something, and then push it to a platform over an IP channel that's then going to expect to see that. And, and in some cases, the vendors don't make that very clear um, how to slice and dice that sensor up. You know, there's hundreds of temp sensors on the market and probably hundreds of ways in which they dimension that data, uh, whether it's Fahrenheit, centigrade, four bytes, two bytes, or so on, right? And so Multitech um, completely publishes all of uh, our decodes. We call it subgig. It's a registered trademark for our, our decodes. It's all publicly done. And recently in the LoRa Alliance, um, repos and how to access repos of all those different sensors. So standardized APIs that reach out pull a vendor's uh, decode, which will be an XML file, and then put that directly into the network server so that that data is decoded coming out of the network server. Just one example of, of how we're, we're trying to reduce the friction points and, and not be stuck in this, well, I'm, I've got 11 bytes, but I have no clue you know, mm -hmm. how to cut this up and make sense of it. Can you believe it's been an hour? <laughs> <laughs> Which means we're coming to the end. I do want to hear uh, from Ben and Terry. Um, for our audience, Ben and Terry have, yeah, I know Ben, but you'll, you'll talk. Uh, ben and Terry have uh, one of the coolest jobs ever because they, they get to be on the kind of the skunk works side of Opta 22, always looking towards the latest, greatest, newest things. And I have a feeling that you guys have been pretty heavily involved um, at least one of you in, in getting, uh, this project, uh, ready to go. So was this your first workings with Laura Wan? Is this something that you've already worked with before and just kind of what were your, some of your takeaways? Well, uh, I'll be a little brief. We're having, uh, some network issues here. Hopefully I'm, I'm coming through clear, but, uh, this is, this is definitely not the first time we've, we've heard of, um, Laura Wan. Um, we've, we've sort of heard the workings of it and, and been looking for a reason to start using it. So we're very excited for, for the possibilities here. You know, the, the idea of yes, that democratiz democratization of, of data, um, and, and especially being able to do it in, um, in a way that's, that's right there on the edge without having any additional hardware is, is very exciting from us. Uh, and, and especially on the, the code side of things and, um, having it be available across, you know, everything from control programs to uh, communication interfaces like MQTT, Sparkplug, um, is all just yeah, very exciting to us, and um, not just exciting in that we actually get to to work with it and develop a little bit, but exciting to see um, what others end up doing with it. Um, that that's something we always love to see is hearing back from. Uh, customers and, and integrators and such uh, like Helen uh, about what, what they're doing with it and what they get excited about. Uh, it, it all comes back to us and it just becomes this cycle. So uh, yeah, there's there's a, a lot for us to be interested in. And, um, you know, it's always great to work on a, a new project that lets us get deeper into something we've heard of, uh, but not had the opportunity to use. So yeah, great opportunity, very exciting. And uh, we're, we're enjoying working on it, but we're going to enjoy it even more when we can see what uh, what people choose to do with it. Awesome. Well said, Terry. Ben, anything to add or did Terry say it all for you? I think Ben's got a bad network connection. That's all right. Hey, um, Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, come back and we'll have Sarah and Jessica working alongside with Benson, I'm guessing Ben or Terry will be there, Alan and myself, and you're going to see the complete build out of the solution. So you'll see the phone come out, you'll see the scan happen. 
the data is going to show up. Uh, the guru is going to get it up to an MQTT broker or to a control system. Uh, and we're going to show you how the entire process has been built. So you're going to get a behind the scenes tour of how you could integrate the exact same solution if you had that hardware signal on your desk. Alan, anything to add before we sign off? Oh, Alan, you're on mute. Thank you, Jeff. No, I, I don't have anything to add. I just want to say again, thank you to uh, BPP and uh, really Multitech and Opto22 for taking a vision that I've like struggled with to, to be able to, to not just like understand how do we do this, but have a clear path forward. And the moment that vision became very clear, um, like Opto has done over and over again for me, they bought into the vision. Michael and his team bought into it and uh, stepped up and we've developed something that's going to be transformational. So I'm really excited about Wednesday. I hope that uh, those that are, whether you're interested or not, if you have to do anything with sensors or OT or even that home automation, I think I just encourage you to come check this out because it's going to be entertaining. Well, even if you're, you know, this is part of a larger data ecosystem than just a control network. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. On the analytics side, if it's not if it's not being captured, we can't use it mm -hmm. to turn yep. to, to create valuable information. So whether this ever hits a control system, or whether it's just getting into the data ecosystem that we need to make information and make inform I'm sorry, make informed decisions, um, it's crucial. Um, speaking of information, Dan, I want to thank you for joining us. For this conversation you've brought a ton of knowledge and experience obviously this is the reason that uh, you show up for work each day you're passionate about it and it really came through thank you so much yeah go multi-tech <laughs> <laughs> the company that we haven't heard of and we've all used i love it oh you're using this every day for sure that's awesome <laughs> well hey listen to all of our guests thank you so much to our audience um and those that are listening to this um in the future or in the now. I don't know. Thank you for your support. And we look forward to seeing you on the project next week. Um, IntegrateLive.com. If you haven't registered, please do so now. Thank you. <laughs>